Hello, welcome back to my channel and book readings for Life is Magic, which is my new book. This is the 10th installment of the book readings and um, you can find all previous installments in the playlist on my channel. So that, well, I would recommend you listen to them in order because um, otherwise this sucker's not going to make much sense because the book is, is a space ride anyway. <laughs> You'll have a better chance of understanding what I'm up to, what I mean, if you check out the previous installments, which are free on this channel. But if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book for yourself and get ahead and get right to the end, you can find it on Amazon.com by looking up my name and the book title, Life is Magic, or you can look up, or you can follow, follow a link to Amazon through my website, which is robfalgiano.com. I have stupid reading glasses they're stupid and they're crooked too. <laughs> um, just slight magnifiers, cheapies, you know, 1.25s for about that much money, a buck and a quarter. So um, you can laugh at my glasses, uh, make fun of them, and that's totally fine with me. But I think I should use them. So here we go. Chapter 17 is called Final Thoughts on God for Now. Thank God. As an eventual follow-up to the existential visitor supposedly informing me that I'm God and you are too and perhaps nothing is real, strawberry fields, ha ha, and we might not exist other than in our own imaginations, I did a random late night internet search to, to, to see what might be out there regarding the topic, was God lonely? Because I worry about God sometimes. Who's got God's back? Everyone asks God for everything. What if God needs a good friend too? It led to some interesting discussion boards and a few eloquent posts by users of Quora, which is a sort of catch-all online platform for discussions about almost everything of interest anyone can think of, written and read by people of all backgrounds and ages around the world. It was comforting to know that I'm not the only one who wondered about God's emotional state before presumably creating the universe. The most interesting take on the subject was posted in 2017 by a woman named Sonia Fanucci. This is her conception of God. Is God lonely? That's what she asks at the top. Once there was a king, a gorgeous and strong and kind and ingenious man whose every thought was brilliant and profound. To be inside his mind was to wander through a wilderness as rich and various that one would never tire and he himself took, took refuge there, dreaming about a world, thousands of world, worlds of endless beauty. Yet outside and around him there was nothing. <laughs> and whenever for a moment he emerged from his imagination, he had to face this awful, terrifying fact. Where he was, when he, where he was pure energy, being and beauty, he existed in a void, a deep darkness of profound nothingness. And whenever he contemplated this, it struck existential terror into his heart. So he receded into his dreams and they became more vivid, more, meaning, more meaningful the deeper that he descended into them until they appeared to take on life, to grow as vivid and, and as gorgeous as he was. They lived because of him and they seemed also to exist despite him, following a dream logic that was somehow transcendent in its wonder and sometimes bizarre in its terror. And he dreamed, oh, and so he dreamed, watching them, feeling their brief illusory lives as if they were his own, surrounding himself with illusions so intense, so fueled by love and passion for them, that he forgot his solitary soul. Is God lonely? I think in some pro profound way he much must be. Okay, so that's all of Sonia's take on it. I literally could not have said it any better though my thoughts on this were fully though my thoughts on this were fully formed before i came across sonia's be beautiful entry a second essay of interest was by a man named clint johnson who posted on the same subject in late 2019 so here's clint's takes clint's take there he was the only eternally immortal eternally immortals capitalized here <clears throat> with the mind of a quantum supercomputer, able to spin up any simulation in the blink of an eye, 
projecting out for, outward from his own eye. But still, does he know? He is alone. Even if he loses himself in his creations, when he remembers, he'll likewise remember why he forgot. It's like 10,000 faces in a house of mirrors. A little ironic, don't you think? Thank God for forgetfulness and for remembrance when one is ready to lose the ego. I shed a tear for him. We always ask for help from him, but do we seek to help him? All that he asks for is a little love. Amor Fati. Somehow it seems that he gives himself for us, to us, so that he may escape his loneliness. Bless God, and may he rejoice in our love. And then he includes a quote in his entry. The wise man who realizes all beings as not distinct from his own self and his own self as the self of all beings does not, by virtue of that perception, hate anyone. The quote continues. <clears throat> Excuse me. What delusion, what sorrow can there be for that wise man who realizes the unity of all existence by perceiving all beings as his own self? And this is uh, an entry from Isha Upanishad um, 6 7. I don't actually know what Isha Upanishad is 6 6 7. So maybe someone wants to fill me in. So that's the end of Clint's entry. And I write in the book, that's a great entry too. I quite like the quote above, above from Upanishad regarding God loving all beings as part of himself as his, and his own self as the shared self of all beings. It reinforces all that's been said. It also reminds us why it's wise to practice empathy and love for others or for as many as possible and to treat them as well as we treat ourselves. For withholding judgment of others is grounds to argue that others should withhold judgment of us, especially since everyone is so imperfect. Besides, it's a near certainty that intelligent beings more advanced than us exist in the universe and other dimensions of spirit. And if they considered humans stupider and much less enlightened, and therefore inherently lesser, would they not then be entitled to judge us or hate us, or perhaps even destroy us, just as we might hate or persecute those we perceive as lesser? Of course not. It always comes back to the supremacy of empathy and love. You can't go wrong with those. And so that's the end of the brief chapter 17. And um, actually, I had organized the books, book chapters into parts 1 and 2, with part 1 being chapters 1 through 17, which we've now completed, and then part 2 of the book being chapters 18 through 37, plus the conclusion. And the second section, well, actually, okay, let me recap. Part one of the book, the first half of the book, uh, was titled Prophecies in Real Time, Family Synchronicities and Miracles, and Musings on the Nature of Reality and God. And now as we begin chapter 18, section two of the book is titled Psychics Vary, Exploring Soul Origins, Spirits and Angels Are Real, and My Dreams Are Crazy and Fun. <laughs> okay, so I think chapter 18 here is kind of on the long side, so I don't know if we'll do all of it. Am I too partial? How are we doing on time? Okay, very good. Okay, chapter 18 is called Rubbing Elbows with Famous Psychics. Back to the world we think we know. Often I feel like a spiritual investigative journalist with feet in two worlds simultaneously. Sometimes I'm completely removed from the mystical, just another inhabitant, an inhabitant of the everyday world of necessary tasks, like earning a 9-to-5 living or grocery shopping. Then in my free time, I peek curiously through the veil to try to understand how spirit works, even though I know I'll never fully understand. Sometimes I'm clearly experiencing the magically divine firsthand, deep down in inexplicable strange beauty, and often when engaged in creative activities like writing and making music, or when synchronicities start piling up one after the other. I also get a lot of interesting and weird ideas in my dreams. I'm plugged into something bigger than myself, which I feel is available to all of us. All right. Coffee break. Pardon me. Mm. Yummy. 
As a Pisces, I'm in the 12th house of the Zodiac, which is said to be the final sign before returning to God slash source. Pisces can be half on earth and half in heaven in terms of awareness. We embody both the real and the unreal. Maybe literally even the dream sea of possibilities from that which is imagined and conjured is made manifest in the physical world. As symbolized by the twin fishes, Pisces have a restless, restless desire to swim in all directions at once, given our endless curiosity and energy. I relate to that. It's obvious, right? <clears throat> I love to share what I think I've discovered about metaphysics and life and hope others find it helpful or interesting. When working on the first book, I avoided outside influences. I didn't know a thing about spirit beyond my family's experiences. There wasn't an, an online community of YouTube psychics to plug into back in 2014, which is when I wrote my first book. Looking back, God Laughs at Dirty Jokes, the title of my first book, is like Spiritualism, Spiritualism 101, a somewhat novice introduction. I hoped the book would feel more plausible if the reader experienced the journey from skepticism to belief in a gradual way, similar to how I experienced it. I'm certain that many great psych psychics are more directly connected to spirit than my family, though it's not a competition. But we've absolutely had our share of amazing experiences. Psychics and readers are as varied in personality and motivations as any group of people. Each has a unique perspective on spirit. By nature, I seem to favor psychics who operate just a little below the radar and are less commercial. My musical tastes are similar. The YouTube readers intuitive and intuitives I discovered in 2020 and continue to follow include Kim Carey at Intuitive View and her sister, Cardvoyant Chris, Sterling Psychic Intuitive, <clears throat> Cindy with Soul Print Intuitive, Tarot Mom slash Becca, Cindy, uh, oops, let's see, sorry, uh, Trudy Lee, Linda G, the Comanche Psychic, Marianne with Revealing Light Tarot, Danny Shea's Bathrobe Tarot, Ellie Dreams Down Under, Lena Rodriguez's Tarot Down Under, Milu, Cash Peters, and Psychic Violetta. Apologies, about, uh, apologies to any I've accidentally omitted. <clears throat> the readers above each have thousands of YouTube subscribers, so they're definitely popular, though not on the scale of the pop culture psychics on television. That's a whole different level of exposure and celebrity in the commercial commercialization of something so important as spirituality gives me pause, even down to selling my own books on the subject, which is probably why I wasn't very good at promoting the first one. When I first began writing about spirit, my unrelated day job was booking concerts and other events at a 1,750-seat performing arts center in Buffalo, New York. I worked there excuse me, for more than 40 for more than 20 years through 2019 and developed relationships with dozens of major national booking, booking agents before starting an independent concert promotion business. The Arts Center brought in an eclectic assortment of attainment for the general public, including pop, rock, jazz, music, professional dance, theater and Broadway, comedy, family shows, opera, etc. Over the years, I booked some big artists like Brian Wilson, Mark Knopfler, Diana Krall, Bonnie Raitt, Tedeschi Trucks Band, Tedeschi Trucks Band, and also smaller acts more to my personal taste, including jazz artists like Petrus Klumpanis, Kendrick Scott, Gretchen Parlato, and Monsieur Perrinet. The feather in my cap was landing a solo tour by Mikhail Baryshnikov for two sold-out performances in 2007. I befriended his manager over a six-month period and eventually convinced them that Buffalo would be a great city for him to visit. Getting 3,500 people to pay for premium tickets to see one of the most famous dancers in the world perform entirely on his own for 90 minutes was both surreal and deeply satisfying. In the early 2000s, as psychics became popular on reality television shows, they began to do more live appearances at venues like ours. Given our eclectic booking philosophy, my peers and I researched a handful of famous psychics and, and discovered that the big ones sold hundreds and even thousands of tickets per show. They were just as popular as some of the major music and dance artists we brought in. There seemed to be an audience for psychics if we picked the right one and the price was right. It seemed like another unique fun event we could bring to Buffalo. A famous female medium from the New York City area is one of the first we looked into. When I finally reached her booking agent on the phone, my jaw dropped. Given her popularity, 
Given her popularity, this psychic makes upwards of six figures per public appearance. And most venues sell individual seats for her shows at upwards of $100 each. That seemed crazy. But if that many people are willing to pay to see her, then I guess her fee is actually in line with demand, even if it feels excessive to me. And then this is in parentheses. To be fair to this... To be fair to this reader, who I won't directly name, I don't know what she does with her money. Maybe she gives half to charity and I'm off base in feeling she may be overpaid or greedy. I've often wondered to what extent big money affects a psychic, seemingly sacred connection, spirit, and or the quality of their readings. Psychics should definitely not be expected to be paupers or to give their time away. Everyone deserves to earn a living, though perhaps a bit of skepticism about all spiritual practitioners and their ideas is healthy, since the realm is as vulnerable to exploitation or fraud as any profession. <clears throat> Some famous readers have large egos or other common personal issues, and no reader is 100% accurate. Psychics are just like the rest of us in terms of variety of personalities and motivations. We should always stick with readers who resonate with us personally. Not everyone is a perfect fit for everyone else. From my own some somewhat wide experiences, I feel the best and most trustworthy readers are humble, honest, and fundamentally kind, and they operate from love, even if sharing difficult news. Good, new, good psychics will leave you feeling uplifted, though even talented psychics can have an off day. They're only human. I wasn't willing to recommend to my bosses that our arts center pay for what the New York City Medium's agent asked for, even if we had been able to make the money back in ticket sales. It just didn't feel right. Then in 2014, after I'd finished writing my first book, another booking agent I'd known for many years pitched a television clairvoyant who, will, who we will refer to as Mr. Mustache. By contrast to the New York City Medium, his fee was only five figures for a paid speaking appearance. It was still a lot of money by most people's standards. At no point did I discuss my spiritual beliefs with my colleagues before or after we booked him. We advertised Mr. Mustache's show purely as entertainment without an endorsement of his supposed abilities. There were a few complaints in the newspaper from reader from readers who said the art center shouldn't host such an event and that we were promoting fraudulent voodoo, though most people didn't seem to care either way. Tickets were modestly priced from $20 to $35. We needed to charge at least that much to try to recoup his appearance fee and hopefully make a profit. The show sold, sold decently with about 750 attendees. The afternoon of the show, I picked Mr. Mustache and his assistant, up at the airport. He seemed friendly, though flamboyant. Given years of experiences working with artists and being one myself, my first impression was that he was self-involved, which isn't unusual. I used to be more like that and am still not beyond ego trappings. And not all ego is bad, and you definitely need a certain amount to get up on any stage. Mr. Mustache's assistant seemed anxious. I didn't know if it had anything to do with working for him, though she mentioned something about his website recently being hacked by some detractors. Her energy was definitely not relaxed. I'm sensitive to that, and I think almost anyone would have noticed. So in some sense, I was a little on alert from that point on. During the car ride, Mr. Mustache expressed excitement about an upcoming speaking event with pop singer Alanis Morissette. My immediate feeling was that he was name-dropping, though I congratulated him. I also knew he had an upcoming appearance on a fairly expensive boat cruise. I looked it up before he came, thus engendering more feelings of ambivalence. Mr. Mustache also said he once hoped to be an actor, which helped to explain his flamboyance. That evening, my mom and brother came to the show, and we sat together in the handicapped section to accommodate Steve's wheelchair my brother Steve. It gave us a bit of privacy, too. When the house lights went down, Mr. Mustache entered the stage via an impromptu cartwheel. As neither a young nor partic particularly lean man, it came off a bit clownish. He was short of breath for a while after. Mom and Steve were a little worried about him. Much of the audience bought tickets in family groups. Many came in hopes of being able to communicate with deceased loved ones on the other side with our guest as the conduit. It brings people great comfort to know that their loved ones are safe and well in the afterlife. That seems to be the general point of personal appearances by popular psychics. Spirits, 
perceivable only to Mr. M and perhaps a few others in the audience, began to arrive on stage. Each soul imparted information about his, her life on earth and or the circumstances of their death, especially when untimely, which he then relayed to the audience. Mr. Mustache asked patrons to raise a hand if it sounded like someone they knew. In each instance, at first, a few dozen people raised their hands. Then as the information about each visiting spirit became more specific, most of the hands went down. By eventual process of elimination, the person or people the spirit had come to speak to were identified. It felt organic and natural. Mr. M shared messages from the departed or facilitated a back and forth exchange. For this part of the program, he was extremely respectful and composed and not remotely showy as at the beginning. Given the sensitive nature of some of the spirits' spirits' deaths and the raw emotions of the family, this was very much appreciated. Mr. M's readings felt absolutely spot on, leaving little doubt as to their authenticity or his ability to communicate directly with spirit. Even some of my skeptical co-workers later noticed this, no, no, noted this. He spoke with dozens of families, and it was a long show. It seemed like people were happy with what was offered and that they had gotten what they'd paid for, so I was satisfied too. One second. Let's see I where we are. This is a long chapter. Okay, forgive me. All right, here we go. Having spent the day with him and his assistant, I can also confirm that there was absolutely no prearranged or fake aspect to the performance. No one in the audience was planted because all, compl all complimentary seating requests would have gone directly through me. The readings were absolutely authentic as far as I could tell. Mom and Steve agreed. The only real downside was the abundance of tragic stories. We thought we recognized the circumstances of some of the spirits that arrived because of coverage in the local newspaper over the years. This included an affable teenage girl who was accidentally killed by a well-known skilled doctor while skateboarding at night in the rain. He had been out drinking before getting behind the wheel. Prior to the doctor's arrest, both mom and her husband, John, both mom, my mom, and her husband John had gone to this gastroenterologist and found him to be very competent. That's how small Buffalo is, even though a million people live here. Earlier in the day, I wondered whether my brother Justin might show up for the show and whether Mr. Mustache would be aware of him. As tempting as it was, I didn't discuss my family with Mr. M that afternoon, other than to say that we'd had some magical experiences and believed in an afterlife. However, deep down, I, I pridefully assumed my brother Steve was as psychically connected as our guest performer, but was simply untrained and also unpaid. All right, let me get some extra light in here. I apologize. All right, that's better. All right, let's see, where am I? Okay, <laughs> these classes are terrible. Maybe someday I'll get real, real one, real prescription ones that don't cost a dollar. Excuse me. At the end of the show, Mr. M asked the audience to close their eyes and to join him in a group prayer, group prayer to connect with spirit. This too was pleasant and respectful. He asked us to envision various colors in the third eye corresponding to the body's energy centers, the chakras. I didn't feel particularly dialed in, though I eventually started to sees faint swirling colors in my third eye towards the end. The next day, I emailed Steve and Mom to see if they'd experienced anything. Mom wrote back, I was ready to close my eyes because I felt connected most of the night. When he said green, my picture started to turn green from just darkness. I invited Sharon and Bob, our old friends, in. I felt they did come, and it made me cry a bit. Bob just passed away last week, and I learned Sharon had died in 2011. I did not know. He grew, he grew up with your dad and lived across the street. I have been really sad about not seeing them over these years, and I believe they have known how I felt all week. I found it peaceful. Perfect. That's mom's take. My mom's take. I wrote back, 
The only question I asked Mr. M after the show was whether there are ever times that he's unable to reach spirits. He said no, though the connection can be stronger some days and that it partly depends on the audience. Mom wrote back, that does make sense, just like everyone else we can and are affected by the people around us. Yes, definitely. The collected energy of any group of people in a, sing in a room has its own shape, as we've discussed. Then I wrote, he also said that sometimes during signings, people startle him when they come up from behind to get their picture taken because spirits approach mostly from the rear, which then reminded me of what he said during the meditation about the soul being located right behind the heart, which actually my friend Kim Carey um, recently said in one of her videos. So maybe it's true. Uh, I never really thought of the soul as having a specific location in the body before. Then mom wrote, I'm not sure I heard him say that. I just feel my soul is in my chest, instilled in childhood probably. They used to show holy pictures in our textbooks, te in our textbooks with the soul looking like a host, smack dab, in the, smack dab in the middle of our chests. I continued, writing back. He was talking to some of the university theater students backstage before the before the show and said he used to work crew on Broadway. They were, rehears they were rehearsing Les Miserables in the small theater last in the small theater next door. He wanted to peek in during rehearsal. I wasn't sure how the teachers would react, but he was bullish and went right in. After a few minutes, I felt that our presence was intrusive. The backstage area is small. I exited and I exited and told him I'd wait in the hall. Then a professor kicked kicked him out and said it was a closed rehearsal. But he looked, but he took it goofily, cheerfully. Mom wrote, he strikes me that way, like a little kid. He will see what he can get away with and then just laughs off the rest. Spoiled by fame. I'd say yes. This is me writing back. I'd say yes. He's entirely pleasant, but a bit spoiled. I also wrote, then I dreamt lucidly and long about hanging out with a British musician named Momus. Uh, and this is in parentheses. He was an early influence on my own songwriting. Then my writing continued. At one point, we were both sta both standing atop enormous adjacent ladders, like hundreds of feet high. I was standing cautiously on the rails, but his ladder was more like a pair of gigantic stilts, and he was just bobbing in the wind. It was interesting. Mom replied, remember, we are out of our body when we sleep. I do like that because it means all those big houses I visit and feel wonderful in are real. You'll get used to that ladder. My, interpret my interpretation is that you aspire to be a momus, and he is agreeing, showing you how to climb the la ladder and go with the flow. Many W's here. Book me at the art center, will you? <laughs> my mom, mom making the joke. I wrote, well, I am like momus, a truth seeker through art, and that's what always gets me in trouble. But he goes even further than, further than I do. Okay, I'll book you at the art center, you know, for a, a mom speaking appearance. And then uh, in parentheses, I wrote, over many years I've exchanged intermittent emails with Momus, a.k.a. Nicholas Curie, and he's popped up in a few other dreams of mine, as have many of my other musical influences. His replies have always been thoughtful and or provocative like his music. The last time I wrote to him was after I finished the first book about spirit my first book in 2014, su suggesting yet another odd worldview for him to ponder if desired, though he had previous th previously declared his atheism. I offered to mail a copy since he was discussed in the book, but this time he didn't write me back. Perhaps my ladder towards mysterious spiritualism had swayed too far from his at last. Ha ha. Steve chimed in on the email conversation, my brother Steve. I went on YouTube when I got home and found a Mr. M story. I guess one time he was interviewed by Barbara, Barbara Walters on The View about a book of his. Anywho, he said to after, her after the interview off air that she should get her blood checked. Something was wrong with it, he thought. He said he was getting negative energy from her during the interv interview, so she got a blood test and it came back fine. Whoops, Mr. M. Then she told that story on TV, so they don't like each other to this day, the YouTube clip said. And Mr. M told the press, now I know why Rosie and Elizabeth left The View. Ouch. 
Okay, so that's the end of my uh, brother's input there for a moment. To be fair to Mr. Mustache, and as you already know, no psychic gets everything right. If he sensed something was, was wrong with Barbara Walters, it may not have been a blood issue, but possibly another ailment. Or perhaps he even perceived her, her skepticism about him, and it colored his perceptions. Steve also noted that, that the majority of Mr. M's spirit visitors at the show in Buffalo we had attended had died in dramatic circumstances. Steve wrote, I enjoyed him. Goofy, but fun for sure. But dark spirit stories might come forth at the show, I thought. I got the sense that it was an off night for him in the good spirit communication department. I guess those dark spirits were talking loudest. And we don't mean dark exactly, just maybe more um, tragic. Sensitive stuff, I know. Steve also confirmed that our deceased brother Justin was present at the end of the evening, though I didn't see him. Justin was one step ahead of Mr. M during the meditation, Steve wrote. I kept my eyes sorry. Excuse me. I kept my eyes open, head down. Justin was behind me and he took one step back towards the end before Mr. M even said those words, instructing visiting spirits to prepare to depart. I smirked because I thought, cool, Justin is a step ahead of the pro medium. Love you. That's the end of Steve's quote. I admit I was disappointed that Mr. Mustache didn't pick up on or acknowledge Justin's presence before, during, or after the show, as I have the biased belief that Justin is a powerfully positive spirit. I think I was also seeking validation for my own connectivity to spirit, which was still very new, and the experiences of my family, though I didn't bring up any of it with him, as mentioned. Stupid glasses. It could also be that Justin didn't make his presence, presence obvious, preferring to let other spirits from families more in need of comfort than ours be heard during the performance instead. Justin would do this, and besides, we have regular contact with him through, through Steve as it is. The experience with Mr. Mustache obviously left mixed feelings. His skills as a clairvoyant were undeniable, and the audience seemed like they were satisfied with what had been offered, but I also knew how the sausage was made and how much money we paid him. If I was at all bothered, does that mean I was at least a bit jealous? I believe I've become humbler as a result of connectivity to spirit. It, is intu it has felt intuitively correct to stay a little bit under the radar, so to speak. I certainly hoped more people would read my first book, but I also wanted it to be the right people. I wanted it to happen or not happen organically and hope spirit would guide me if I needed to be more overt in self-promotion. It doesn't come naturally, naturally to me, and I'm generally skeptic of products which are heavily marketed, wondering if that's to mask the quality of the product itself. Mom responded, <clears throat> I think most of those schleps, meaning pop culture psychics, she wrote in parentheses, become full of themselves. Plus, can you imagine how boring it would be to talk about the same thing over and over and over? I thought of that during his show. He's raking in what he can, which is not bad. I did not like Sylvia Brown either. I just found her somewhat interesting. All of those guys are in for the bucks, or they would still be doing, doing it in their kitchens for $20. What if he is a big phony baloney and us feeling spirits is all bullshit? <laughs> Asked Mom. How's that for the thought of the day? Kisses. I wrote back, I think there must be a fine line between making a living from it and turning it into another big money industry. He's very well paid for what he does, yet at the same time, he seems to genuinely help people reconcile their grief. I liked what he said about spirit during the show, and it seemed legit when he was channeling spirits. Steve and you both had pretty strong connections to the other side, too. I continued, it's one of the issues in publishing my own book, how to keep it clean when money becomes involved. I don't fully trust what an association of people does to the original intent of connecting to spirit. And then the word hug is written all in caps with a lot of G's. Hug, hug, go, 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 go. <laughs> That's the end of that um, written exchange. So, my feelings about psychic communities are still evolving. Anyone dabbling in spirit has to be cautious about motives and associations, especially given the powerful energies involved. Though I'm not a big joiner, I acknowledge 
that the pooling of spiritual energies can have a beautiful, positive, magnifying effect under the right circumstances, especially when those involved are highly altruistic and especially if, if their thoughts and prayers are focused on the greater good. Mom continued, I told Steve that since I have been living from the place where I'm a spiritual being having a human experience, I have felt a great deal of peace. Don't get me wrong, I get stressed, but that is part of the human experience, learning how to deal with it, or learning that you can deal with it. As Mr. M said, we are here to experience as much as we are supposed to, and then poof, we are out of here. That is extremely com comforting in its own way, Mom continued. So, our Justin came for such a brief time, dying just hours after his birth, but look at all he taught us, unconditional love for someone who gave but a few hours of time. He taught so many how to be compassionate. He taught me that not everyone can have empathy. He showed me a lot about your dad. He showed me how, you, how much you and Steve love him. That is huge. This life is definitely a precious, precious journey. I only wish more people would get it, but maybe they are. Kisses, Mama. <clears throat> I wrote back, yes, I agree that Justin was meant for his role, guiding and helping us from the outside. I find it amazing. Mr. M said that we choose in advance who we come here with. That feels correct. We were fated to be together, and I am very grateful. I go in and out of being peaceful, I continued. I feel like the world has been resisting me, resisting us, with all its might for our entire lives, I wrote. And I see people like us victimized over and over again all around us and around the world. The amount of injustice is so great. Yes, I wish there were more like us so that we had a bigger network of support. That said, I feel a bit better today than I have in a while. Maybe it's a weekend thing and, or I'm coming out of the funk cloud. Love ya. Mom dropped the final bits of wisdom. Years ago, I think I was a lot like you. Idealistic and feeling I needed to change the world, point the wrong things out, blah, blah, blah. But then I realized that my life and how I behave is all that counts. Do the best you can and shrug your shoulders a lot. The energy vampires will always be there. Manage them. Don't let them manage you. Avoid anger at all costs. It only hurts you. So true. The world is not resisting us. It is waiting for us to join in the flow, she added. Yeah, got that one right. Seriously, it is up to us to stop feeling like we are being tortured. We are not. Our minds need to be clear and know that some things in life are not personal. How we react is the key. Then there's a little um, dot, 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 indicating a slight break in thought from within the same chapter. And then we got a page left for this chapter, and that's where we'll end. As mentioned before, a few years after Mr. Mustache's visit to Buffalo, I began to discover the plethora of talented YouTube psychics from around the world. One of the most accurate I'm aware of is Linda Grindel. Grindel? Grindel. Grindel. Also known online as Linda G, the Comanche Psychic. Excuse me. Pardon me. Linda resonates with a lot of people because she has a sharp sense of humor and she gives all credit to her spirit guides who she says deliver important messages to pass on to her online followers. Among her more remarkable predictions, her spirit guides told her about a devastating global virus which turned out to be COVID-19 all six months before it happened. This isn't just anecdotal. The proof is in a video that she posted on her, on her YouTube channel in August 29, which is still available to view. Her spirits gave her a glimpse of our dangerous future with populations in surgical masks. Though she and we had no sense of the enormous scale of the epidemic at the time, the images flashed before her eyes. Excuse me. In a more recent video from May 2020 titled, Sorry I Was Away, Linda joked that she could never have her own TV show because the energy and time she'd have to dedicate to it on top of what she needs to do to stay centered while interacting with powerful energies would be detrimental. She definitely believed it would negatively impact her psychic abilities and the quality of her readings. This made me feel like maybe I wasn't totally off base and at least questioning how money and fame might become problematic for a psychic. We know money is necessary, but when fame and riches are the primary motivators, there might be an unintended effect upon a psychic's energy. Who does one attract into one's orbit when the psychic, psychic ability becomes big business? 
might fame and big money also affect their connectivity to realms where true wealth is likely measured differently? Nothing in life is really free anyway. There are always consequences to our choices. And that concludes chapter 18. So, your thoughts are most welcome below. Thank you for listening. I will try to be a little quicker with the next reading, trying to get back into a regular habit and flow. Uh, so thanks for checking it out. Again, if you'd like to pick up the book on Amazon, it's available in paperback form at this time and um, off the link off my website. So thanks for uh, being here. Appreciate it. Take care.